And it was still in Ephesians. You're going to be in Ephesians till we hit the chapter 6, last verse. The second half of chapter 3 is where we're at. And again, Paul just erupts into prayer. And I found a verse in Psalm 109, verse 4, which I've earmarked, I've, I've coloured it in in green as a, as a prayer. Anything in my Bible that's green is a prayer. But if you take out the italics, which is what the translators put in to make it read in a more acceptable fashion, King David is simply saying, I am prayer. I am prayer. Not just a lifestyle, but himself. He, he became prayer. That every breath that he prayed was a prayer unto God. And this is what we find in Ephesians. That Paul starts with a prayer of praise that we're chosen, accepted, beloved, um, you know, got every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. He just erupts with this, this eulogy of who we are in Christ. He's sort of saying, do you know who you are? And then he, he goes into prayer in the second half of chapter 1. And then in chapter 2, it's like, this is who you were. You were dead in your sins and you were dead in this. But now you're alive in Christ and you're seated with him in heavenly places. So chapter 2 marks, you know, like a, 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 an understanding that we can live an ascended lifestyle. And then chapter 3, we looked at the first part of that last week. And... Um, He talks about the mystery that had been concealed until this time. That is now, the mystery of God is now revealed. It wasn't revealed in the Old Covenant. It wasn't revealed through King David. King David got snatches of it. But this is revealed through Paul. This is revealed through the apostles. This is the mystery of these times. And the mystery, one of the mysteries is um, Christ in us, the hope of glory, as it says in Colossians. But I want to read Ephesians chapter 3. The, from verse 13 to the end out of the Mirror Translation Bible. Has anyone heard of that apart from Shane? Yeah? This, so this is out of that. It says, and I, I'm not going to go into because it goes into all of the Greek words and the, the, all those. I'm not going to. It'll be on the table over there if you want to have a look at it. But I'm just going to read because he, he writes it a little bit differently. He says, and, and understand that he's in prison. He's writing this book of amazing prayer and praise from prison. Like he's imprisoned. And then he says in verse 13 of chapter 3 in Ephesians, you have no reason to feel embarrassed or responsible because of what I'm suffering. Rather feel honoured. Now this is going to be different to your translations. Just sit back and listen. He says, you have no reason to feel embarrassed or, or responsible because of what I'm suffering. Rather, feel honoured. Overwhelmed by what grace communicates, I bow my knees in awe before the Father. Every family in heaven and on earth originates in him. His is mankind's family name, and he remains the authentic identity of every nation. I desire for you to realise what the Father has always envisaged for you so that you may know the magnitude of his intent and be dynamically reinforced in your inner being by the Spirit of God. Who wants to be dynamically reinforced by the Spirit of God in our inner being? And then he goes in verse 17, this will ignite your faith to fully grasp the reality of the indwelling Christ. You are rooted and founded in love. Love is your invisible inner source, just like the root system of a tree, the foundation of a building. The dimensions of your inner person exceed any other capacity that could possibly define you. Love is your reservoir of superhuman strength, which causes you to see everyone equally sanctified in the context of the limitless extent, limitless extent of love's breadth and length and the extremities of its dimensions in depth and height. I desire for you to become intimately acquainted with the love of Christ on the deepest possible level. 
far beyond the reach of a mere academic intellectual grasp. Within the scope of this equation, God finds the ultimate expression of his image and likeness in you. You are filled with all the fullness of God, awakened to the consciousness of his closeness. So separation is an illusion. Father, Son and Spirit desire to express themselves through your touch, your voice, your presence. They are so happy to dwell in you. There is no place in the universe where God would rather be than in you. We celebrate Elohim who supercharges us powerfully from within. Our biggest request, our most amazing dream, cannot match the extravagant proportion of his thoughts towards you. God is both the author and conclusion of the glory on display in the Ecclesia, mirrored in Christ Jesus. The encore continues throughout every generation, not only in this age, but also in the countless ages to come. Amen. Amen. What a prayer. What a prayer. I'll leave this over here if anyone wants to have a look at it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. So Paul just erupts into prayer. You can see that his whole life is prayer, that everything about him is prayer, like every thought becomes a prayer. But the interesting thing is that he does not pray for people according to their needs. He prays for them according to the love of God, what God has for them. He doesn't say, oh, this poor, this poor church, you know, this, this church, oh, my gosh, they're in such a mess. Oh, God, would you sort out the mess? He just comes in and he says, they are, you are so blessed. You are so amazing. Father dwells in you. These are the plans that he has for you. This is what he's got for you. It is the most amazing way of praying. It gets rid of all kinds of um, weird intercession, if I can use the word weird for intercession, where we sort of concentrate on the person's deficiencies or what they're going through instead of concentrating on the power, the love, the magnificence and the excellence of our God. If you want to come and sit down, Lynn, you're welcome to. You know. So, you know, Jesus prayed a prayer for us before we go back into Ephesians. Jesus prayed a prayer for us in John chapter 17. He prayed for us. That prayer is still going before the Father. He prayed for us. Like, how beautiful is that? But in the very beginning of John chapter 17, verse 1, he said, now I said that, glorif oh, let me just get the truth. Um, I left my old amplified at home. I think it's up to another trip in the car. He said, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may also glorify you. That's what he prayed. So aren't we also sons? So isn't this prayer also applicable to us? So don't, don't get big headed. Stay in the humility of Christ. But Jesus was actually saying here, Father, make me a big deal. So I can make a big deal of you. Glorify me. Exalt me so that you can be glorified and you can be exalted. And um, out of a pure heart, we can pray this, right? Um, but that word glorify means Jesus is actually saying magnify me, celebrate me, honor me, adorn me with a luster, clothe me with splendor, impart glory to me so that you can receive it. Yeah. And if you know what... It, Whatever Jesus prayed for himself, you can pray for you. You're not being blasphemous. You are in Christ. Christ is in you. So when he said, Father, glorify me, so you can be glorified, we can pray the same prayer because you're in Christ. You're actually dead to the flesh. So when we pray that out of a pure heart, like, come on. Because what it is, we're supposed to be light on a hill, right? Most of us are hidden. Or we're very visible in Christian circles. 
But it's not about that. Where do the world know where to go if they can't find us? So we have got to start recognising that the bride of Christ actually is rather proud of her position. And we allow Father to glorify us as he wills. The humility is in staying submitted to Christ. But then allowing him to do what he wants in our lives. So when Jesus is praying this prayer, glorify your son so that you may be glorified. He's also praying that for us because we're the sons of God as well. Gender, you know, according biblically, gender specific. Because it doesn't mention daughters of God. It only talks about sons of God, but it does talk about the bride of Christ. So, you know, like whatever we are. It is time to take off the things that you are holding and hiding under. And I don't care where you think you are in life. I don't care how much you think you've achieved or accomplished. No more shadows. Come out into the light. No more shadows. And this is something that Paul was praying. So I really need you guys to get this. I really need you to understand this. Because the beautiful thing about Jesus, oh, with so many beautiful things, but one thing, that one word that stuck in my head from Bible college, like there's not a lot that stuck in my head from Bible college. Some things pierced my heart. A lot of things were there for the tests and the assessments and then just, you know, because you just, but one thing that stuck was the hypostatic union, which I love the word, I think, I think and they're talking in Bible college like we would know what that is, you know. So, But a hypostatic union is that Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man at the same time. Yes. What do you think we are? The same. The same. New creation reality. In Christ and Christ is in us. New creation reality. That unity, that, sep that we can't be separated. It's just that oneness, that unity. And so when, when Jesus was praying this, he's also praying, I think, that we would wake up. And so Paul opens in prayer in Ephesians. He explodes through prayer. He closes in prayer. The very last thing he talks about in prayer is in Ephesians chapter 6 is prayer. And the one thing that we need to understand is that the glory of the church, the glory of open heaven, the glory of the church, the body of Christ is in Christ Jesus. And that's mentioned in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 6, 12 and 14, that the glory of the church is in Christ Jesus. So any time that we are dealing, for want of a better word, with Christ, you're actually dealing with the church. And if you're dealing with the church, you're dealing with Christ. Because we're one. With a body, he's the head. Separate us from the head, got a problem, but we're not. So we've, got to, we've really got to get a revelation of this in our hearts. You are so one. You are so one, Karen. So one. So enveloped and encased in Christ. And Christ is so enveloped and encased in you. Hypostatic union. It's just the most exquisite mystery. Like you can't put this into words that people's heads can understand. It, it, it's a revelation that can only come from the spirit of wisdom. But this is who we are and this is what's so important. You cannot have Christ without the church because he's the head and we're the body. And you can't have church without Christ, although there are some churches that lock Christ out. But then you have to question whether or not they're a church. Right? And seven times in the book of Ephesians, Christ and the church are so um, intertwined, so inseparable. Christ and the church, church and the Christ. Eleven times in the book of Ephesians, like it's it, it's the, what was one is the other. However, the, the, when the, the, for want of a better word, when the divinity of Christ in the church starts to diminish, 
The, hum the humanness of man fills the vacuum, which is a danger. It's not the way it should be. And when the humanness starts to diminish, there is also a challenge. Because sometimes we get so caught up with our programs, our fastings, our, uh, you know, our Bible studies, our prayers, our fastings, our visions, our dreams, what God is doing in us, with us, through us, for us, blah, 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 that that fills the vacuum. But that's more about what we do rather than who we are. And so we need to come back that the church is always Christ. And Christ is always the church. And there will be a divine blend of divinity and humanity as the Holy Spirit works at the work in us. Am I making sense? So this is the divine blend because if we become so caught up um, with if the humanness kind of evaporates and we get caught up with the, the so-called divinity of things and we get caught up with what we do, oh, we're getting this fast and that fast and, you know, with this Bible study and we're doing this and all these, all these things, we forget to be a family. We forget to love each other. We forget to be warm and welcoming and hospitable and gracious. That's the challenge. And so to allow Christ to be Christ in the church and to bring about both deity and divinity and humanity, to bring that about as he wills in a way that would please the Father, not what we would think, because it's not about our programs. It's not about us, it's about him. And so it's like recognising, well, this is really weird. Like there's no way that I can be 100% like, you know, God and Christ and, and in him and he's in us and, and, and the church and everything. But just allow the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit does best, which is to bring life to everything. And he keeps us in the truth. But you're finding already an attack on the church in the world. And the church has retreated. I'm not saying all churches, but some of them retreat because we don't want to rock the boat. We want to be, a, you know, we, we just, what do they call it, seeker friendly? It's not about that. It's standing up for truth, standing up for Christ, standing up for what is real and what is true. It is standing up for those things, which is allowing Christ to be Christ in us, but in a way that our humanity responds to other people. So we need to have this divine blend of divinity and humanity, just like Jesus is 100% son of God, 100% son of man. That's who he is. So we've got to have this, we've got to keep the family aspect, loving people, welcoming them, being hospitable, just appreciating people, recognising nobody has their act together. Everybody has a need of some kind. Everybody's got an area that, that is under construction, but loving them into wholeness. Yeah. We love people into wholeness. So Paul's prayer in Ephesians is pretty amazing. But if you have a look in Revelation chapter 2, and I'm going to read this one out of the um, message because it's got a little bit more like, ouch. So Revelation chapter 2 is one of the warnings that John wrote to the church, the seven churches, almost like he, that was his circuit, these seven churches. This is approximately 30 years later from the prayer that Paul prayed for Ephesians. So one generation later, this is what John says in, Revel in Revelation 2, starting in verse 1. Write this to Ephesus, the, to the angel of the church, the one with seven stars in his right fist grip, striding through the golden seven light circle speaks. I see what you've done. I see your hard, hard work, your refusal to quit. I know you can't stomach evil, that you weed out apostolic pretenders. I know your persistence, your courage in my cause, that you never wear out, but you walked away from your first love. Why, he says, what's going on with you anyway? Do you have any idea how far you've fallen? That is a Lucifer fall. That's an Adam fall, a Lucifer fall. You walked away from your first love. So he says, come back, recover your dear early love. There's no time to waste, for I'm well on my way to removing your light from the golden circle. So 30 years earlier, they've got this rich letter from Paul saying, um, you know, th this is your wealth in Christ. This is how you walk it out in Christ. And then you can go to war in Christ. So we've got this amazing, but 30 years later, 
Even though they're still doing all the good things, they're doing all the good things. They're a church that has lost their divinity, so to speak, and have stepped into human or they're, they're, and stepped into mainly doing human things like humanity. I, I know you've worked hard. I know you do this. I know you've weeded out the false. I know this. I, I, you don't quit. Awesome, but where's your love? You've walked away from your first love. So in one generation, that church was j just about had its lamp put out. How do we safeguard what God is doing in open heaven for the next generation? How do we ensure that the fight doesn't come in here but doesn't show up until later? Time bombs. So in these seven churches, I'm not going to go through all of them, and it's a little bit of a digression, but I want you to understand how far the church at Ephesus had fallen after these amazing prayers, after everything that God was doing, like incredible prayers of intercession from Paul. Poured his heart out for them, and yet in a generation they lost it. So in these seven churches, John writes of lukewarmness, Satan's synagogue, Satan's throne, where Satan lives, false teachings, uh, the works of the Nicolaitans, teachings of Balaam, Jezebel, deep things of Satan, like all of that in those seven churches. What happened? How did, how did Ephesus lose its first love? What caused them to turn away? And this is where Ephesians 6 um, verses 10 on, the warfare comes in. Maybe they weren't skilled in the warfare. Maybe they didn't recognise that when Satan attacks churches, he doesn't come from outside. I mean, there's persecution, there's accusations. But a lot of time when he comes to work in a church, it's inside. A little bit of gossip, a little bit of someone being upset with someone else. You know, those kind of subtle, sneaky things that come into relationships. But in everything, Ephesus had been warned. But Ephesus had still lost 30 years later. So we can't assume anything. But we can trust in God continuing to work in us. But the, the real thing I think that we need to remember is that Jesus Christ must be the heart of Open Heaven Ministries. Yes. And Jesus Christ must be the head of it. Yes. So that we do not turn away from our first love. And that's why I was, that worship today, Peter, was just, just a well of deep refreshing. And so this prayer is all about Ephesians 3, 13 to the end, is all about the love of God and the power of God. You can't have the power without the love and you can't have the love without the power because love is the power. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Love is the power. So any time that we fall away from love, we, we start to become powerless or, or, or less powerful than what we should be. That's why that's the first commandment, isn't it? To love God with every part of our being to, and to love people as we love ourselves. So what would we do? So this is about um, love and it's about power in us. This is the prayer. And when the power and the love of God come together, when they come together in us, man, when I'm so in love with Jesus and I'm so in love with the person standing in front of me because I can see Jesus in them, whether they're saved or not, and I've got the love of God flowing through me, then I would, uh, the power just oozes out to transform their life. Any power that is released to heal people and there's no love, doesn't work. So we had a Bible college, a Bible study night one night. Like I'm talking forever ago, back in the time of Noah, uh, when we had it. And I was, you know, I wasn't on staff or anything, but we had a Bible study. And a woman was in pain. She had, um, oh, I'm not sure what she had, but she was in pain. And she asked the pastor for prayer. And the pastor, bless him, I think he must have had a big day. And it was kind of like, now I've got to do the Bible study. Then I can go home. You know, that kind of a... And so he's just wanting to get the Bible study done. But this lady wanted prayer. And so she nailed him and she said, I really need you to pray for me before you leave. And he really didn't want to. And she said, I need you to pray. So he just prayed. 
like in the name of Jesus be healed kind of thing. And she said to him, well, that won't work. <laughs> she nailed him. She said, that won't work. And he said, what do you mean it won't work? And she said, there wasn't an ounce of love in that prayer. And faith works by love. There wasn't an ounce of love. There wasn't an ounce of faith. Faith works by love. I'm, that prayer did nothing. Do you want to try again? So, <laughs> so he took a bit of time. He acknowledged that she was right. And he took a bit of time. And then he prayed again. And her pain left. But see, faith works by love. And love is power. And that first commandment isn't there just to occupy our mindset. It's there to be a lifestyle. And, you know, if you say, well, I, I can't love, I don't feel love, I can't love, I can't love that person. Dear God, you know what they did to me. You know, we've all got those kind of attitudes at times, but Romans 5.5 5 says it's the Spirit of God, it's the Holy Spirit that cascades the love of God into our hearts for people. So I can't stand before God at any time and say, well, I don't love them. I tried, God, but they were completely unlovable. I tried to love them, but, you know, it just didn't work. It was them. It was them. I tried, but there was no love in me. Or he's going to say, well, you know, the Holy Spirit was pouring my love into your heart all the time. We have no excuses. We have no excuses. And love is key. And this is something that Paul was praying in this, in this prayer. The prayer was, you know, in the first prayer in Ephesians chapter 1, it was about three things that, that God wanted us to know. But this prayer is about three things that Paul wanted us to have and to live. So the first prayer in Ephesians 1, the last part of that, was three things I need you to know. Know the hope of your calling. Um, know the power that works within you. I can't remember, but there were three things. This one is three things that he wants you to have. See, I don't think we quite understand that love is a frequency. Love is a frequency. Worship that channels through love is a frequency. Worship that we get involved with because it's a Sunday and we're supposed to worship and the team is there and we, we worship. There's no frequency in that, that that resonates in heaven. So we've got to learn to put our roots deep down into the Father's love and, have, and let love be a rock-solid foundation under our feet. It is, an, it is a frequency. So in verse 13, Paul says, I'll go back to Ephesians. Paul says, I don't want you to be discouraged. I ask that you don't lose heart. Therefore, he said, because of everything that's been going on, we've talked about it before this. I ask that you don't lose heart at my tribulations for you. Don't lose heart that I'm in prison. Don't lose heart at what my persecution. Don't worry about that. This is for your glory. He, even though he's writing it from prison, he says, don't look at my circumstances. This is for your glory. This is what I'm pouring out for you. It didn't. He, remember we talked about last time, Paul was not an, a prisoner of Rome. He was a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Christ had so activated or, or attracted him that he become Christ's bond slave. He said, I belong to Christ. I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ, right? And therefore, Rome think they might have him as a prisoner, but they had no power over him. And even in Philippians, when he's writing in the book of Philippians, and he's saying, you know, um, some of them preach Christ because of me. Some of them preach Christ in spite of me. They don't agree with me, but they're preaching Christ to have a go at me. He said, but that's okay as long as Christ is being preached. Yes. As long as Christ is being preached. So he says, don't lose heart. Don't be discouraged at what I'm going through. He says, because there's a glory that's coming. And then he rushes straight into the prayer. It's almost like, well, okay, look, that one sentence, don't worry about it. Don't worry about what's happening to me. And then it's just straight into the prayer. Like it's, like it's so full. It's almost like a waterfall that just wants to, to rush straight out of him. And it just flows. And basically he's saying, I want you as the church to lay hold of the highest and the fullness that is yours in Christ. Now, there's so much, he says. There's so much more than what you could even ever imagine. And so there's three things that he wants you to have. And those things are, he says, I want you to be strengthened with power by the Holy Spirit in your inner man. Right? Be strengthened with power by the Holy Spirit in your inner man. 
The second thing is, he said, I want you to be rooted and grounded in love. When you're rooted in something, when you're grounded in something, you can't be taken out of it. You can't be moved from it. You are established. You're there. And then he says, the last thing I want you to have, and this is verses 16, 17, and 18, but we'll look at that. He says, I want you to be filled with all the fullness of God. So in the natural, that's an impossibility. But in the spiritual, that is that is a reality, right? That's the climax of the prayer. He's saying, I want you to be filled with all the fullness of God. So if I'm filled with all the fullness of God, there's no room for anything of Suzette. There's no room for anything of anybody else. There's no room for media anxiety. There's no room for business care. I am filled with the fullness of Christ within me. Oh my gosh, filled with the fullness of the presence of God. There is no room for anything else no room and when you get that revelation the things that come up to you from the past the things that people say to you the things that aren't working for you in business or in ministry or finances or whatever it doesn't matter because you are filled with the fullness of Christ on the inside and if you are filled with the fullness of him every need is met every need is met there's no lack every provision is there the wisdom the knowledge the understanding the finances whatever you need it's there you are filled with the fullness of God like isn't that the most incredible gift just the most incredible gift so years ago when I was working at that place where I used to work dear God that was such a stretch I would meditate Colossians 1 9 going up that I am filled with a full deep and clear knowledge of God's will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding so I can walk worthy of him fully please him bear fruit in every good work and grow and increase in the knowledge yes. and my relationship with God I prayed that going up I pray in tongues coming home I was promoted from receptionist to general manager over four campuses in three months strictly God strictly God answerable to nobody except the directors Strictly God, only Christian in the whole place. Staff of 80. Whoa. Only Christian. But I was filled with a full, deep and clear knowledge of God. So anytime there was a problem, I, it, it just flowed out. Because I got the revelation that if I am filled with the full, deep and clear knowledge of God's will, then there's no room for Suzette's will. There's no room for the will of anybody else. There's no room for anything but I'm filled with the knowledge of his will I'm filled with it so there's not room for even a drop of anything else and this is what he wants you to know that you are filled with the fullness of God in Christ filled with the fullness like isn't that the most amazing thing oh my gosh filled with Christ you are to be filled to your utmost capacity, completely possessed, completely pervaded, completely permeated, completely saturated with the presence of Christ. So filled with him that there's no room for anything else. So full with him that it oozes out of you, that it covers you. You are to be filled by Christ, who is the fullness of God. You are to be the, who is the head over all things to the church. You have an entire sanctification. It is the highest. It is the purest. It is the richest. It is the deepest aspect. It is an utter description of the love and the life of Christ that is being poured into you. You are not who you say you are. You are who God says you are. You are complete in Christ. Complete in Christ. You are filled with the fullness. And so in verse 14, he says, For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. I bow my knees. What does that mean? It means reverence. It also means submission. It means if you're on your knees, you can't get up and run away. Right? It takes a bit to get up and move if you're on your knees, particularly if you're my age. It takes a bit. You can't assert yourself. There is a vulnerability when you are on your knees before another person. You say, I'm vulnerable. I am on my knees. I am completely, willingly submitted yes. to the Father, to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Every family on the planet has the foundation of the heavenly Father at its root. So it doesn't matter what your family is like. It says every family in heaven and on earth. It doesn't mean families that are believers 
or born again, it says every family in heaven and on earth is originated from the Father. And so you can look at your family. I can look at mine sometimes and think, man, dysfunctional, dysfunctional. But the root of the foundation of my family is the Father in heaven. And so it's so easy to say, Father, would you please, Father, this family, would you please father this person, father us. We need a father to father us. We are some of the most um, orphan, so many orphans in the church. And that's, that's becoming less as people become more aware of sonship. But there's so many people with a, a, an orphan heart, an orphan attitude, an orphan a- aspect of provision. You know, like it's never going to be enough. I was always like living day to day. But when you, have a, when you know that you know that you know that your father in heaven is your father, that he's the root and he's the foundation of the family that you're in on earth, that he's the foundation and the root of the family in heaven, which you're a part of because you're born again through Jesus Christ, the father in heaven. Oh, my gosh. You can just say, Father, would you father me? I've got a problem. Father, I'm coming to you as my dad. I have a problem. I have a challenge. Would you please step in and help me out as my Abba Daddy? It brings such a stability and such a power into our lives. And then he says in verse 16, that he would grant you according to, I personalise these prayers, that he would grant me according to the riches of his glory, that I would be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that he grants me according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That is the rich treasury of glory, strengthened and reinforced in our, in our man by the Holy Spirit. And that might there that, you know, that you would strengthen me according to the riches of your glory, that I'm strengthened with might. That word might is dunamis, which is the miracle working power of God. But when it talks about strength, that word is kratos, and it talks about the mighty power of God. So you go back to the original and think, oh my goodness, I am being strengthened by miracle working power, and I am being strengthened with the mighty power of God. When you've got the miracle working power, power of God and the power and the almighty power of God himself working on the inside of you what on earth do we have to worry about I'm strengthened with that in my inner man strengthened by the wonder working miracle working power of God dunamis and and strengthened with kratos the mighty power of God in my inner man there's no room for depression oppression there's no room for fear anxiety because you're strengthened with everything, the power of God in your inner man. And as long as that is over your soul, everything is good. It says in verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you are being rooted and grounded in love. Now remember, according to Galatians, faith works by love. So you've got the two of them together right here. He says, but I want you to know that Christ is actually living, inhabiting your heart. He is, he's in your heart by faith. And, and that means, you know, like you are God's address. You want to know where God lives on earth? He lives in you. You are his dream home. You are his address. How amazing is that? You are his address, Rebecca. Want to know where God lives? Well, he lives in Rebecca. Do you know what he thinks of Rebecca? She's, she's his dream home. We are his dream home. Do you have any idea of how much he loves you? But he says, I want you to be rooted. I want you to be rooted in love. And Gwyn, help me here because I'm probably going to get it wrong and you are the agricultural ex- expert. But that word radical means when the seed breaks open and the root goes down. So he's expecting us to be radical because the seed, the incorruptible seed of the word of God in us, when that seed breaks open and the root goes down, that's radical. That's what it means agriculturally, radical. He wants you to be rooted radical in love. Radical in love. Like what would it mean to be radical in love? to God, to yourself, to others. What would that look like? 
So I was watching something on um, Instagram the other day and this guy was talking, he'd given a sermon about seeing Christ in other people and if Christ was doing what they were doing, would you help? And so this young boy, young teenager, listened to it and he said, I'm going to do this for two weeks. What changed his life? He got home and he saw his mum washing up and he thought, well, if Jesus is washing up, I'd go and help him. So he went and helped his mum. And then he saw something else, so he went and helped his dad. And then he did something, and so he went and helped this person. But it was all coming from that point, Christ in them. Wow. I'm going to love the people. I'm going to love the Christ in them. Wow. And if Christ is, I'm going to go and help them because Christ is in them. And I don't think we've got that revelation, right? Wow. Give it to us, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I don't know if anyone remembers, uh, oh, I can't remember his name now, glasses, Tony Camer um oh, he was an Italian guy. I'm talking about 30, 40 years ago when I first became a Christian. And he was, he was, um, he was a white church in an African-American, a white man in an African-American church, which was quite something. And um, he loved it, but he would sometimes get the, you know, the accent on happening when he was preaching. Mm. And, um, but he was talking about his walking home from a, a conference or something one night and he was accosted by a, a prostitute and she was offering herself to him. And he was just like, all he could think of was Christ is in her. Mm. Yeah. Christ is in her. Yeah. The depth of the love of Christ that is with her even in what she's doing. Mm. And so he talked to her as though Christ was in her which he was, and she got saved. Mm. And it wasn't about what her work was. It wasn't about who she was. It was about the value that God had placed on her life yes. by Christ himself, both dying and living, but seeing Christ in other people. What would that be? What would that revolutionise for you? How radical would that make you? Rooted, radicalised in love, grounded, established, secure, stable in the love of God. I so desire this. I'm not there. But I've started the journey, as Andrew Walmack says. I'm not there yet, but I'm on the journey. But just recognising, oh my goodness, God, the value you've placed on that person. Jesus died for that person. How can I not honour that? How can I not honour that? We have got to become radical lovers of God and of people. Amen. Grounded. That's our foundation, made stable by the love and the power of God. And then he says in verse 18, wherever 18 is, may you be able to comprehend with all the saints the width and length and depth and height. So uh, may you be able, can you have the full strength to comprehend, to possess, to govern the breadth, the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ? He says, are you able to have the capacity to fully seize and possess and understand the width the extent of the love of God, the length of it, the depth of it, the profound mysteries, the deep things of God, but also that we can be so deeply mired in sin that Jesus still has to reach down into that sin and bring us up. What kind of capacity do you have to comprehend the mystery of the breadth and the, the length, the depth and the height of love? And then he says in verse 19, that you would know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. That you would know, that you would be intimately aware of and related in with the agape love of Christ, which transcends, which surpasses, which exceeds any kind of knowledge that you might have. It's a totally spiritual thing. He says, do you know this? Can you comprehend the width, the length, the depth and the height that you would know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge? He's saying here that nothing in the world can do this. It has to come from the realm of the spirit, that you would be filled with all the fullness of God. This is a prayer that you need to be praying over yourself daily till you get the revelation of it. 
that you would be filled with all the fullness of God and Christ. It says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 19, I think, that Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Yes. So the fullness of the Godhead dwells within you. Yes. It's there. You are filled, liberally supplied, complete, finished, furnished. There's a, a, a presence, a power, an agency, the riches of the fullness of the wealth of Christ living on the inside of you. When you look inside of you in the realm of the spirit, there is the fullness of God. There is no room for anything else in the realm of your spirit but that. You are so complete in Christ. So complete is absolutely the most amazing thing. Everything is ours in the King and his love. And he says in Ephesians 1.23, this is his body. Who's his body? We are, right? Which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So you are full. You are complete. So the thing is that we often come to God on a point of lack. God, I don't have enough. But in God's eyes, you've already got everything. So we're not praying in accordance with the will of God. So it's one thing to have a chat with him and say, look, I just really need to talk to you about my finances, my health. I want to have a chat. This is what, where I'm at. This is what it looks like in the natural. But I know that Jesus has met that. Jesus has delivered me from the curse of death, sin and hell and poverty. He's redeemed me. But my life's not lining up with that. So can we have a chat, a dialogue, communicate with me about this? But in our prayers, I don't come from a place of poverty. I don't come from a place of I don't have. I come from a place of I'm your daughter. I'm a member of your royal household. I'm in covenant with you and Papa. I just want to thank you that you already give me everything that I need. You've already made full provision. I thank you that you've given me everything. Full provision is mine. Whether it's wisdom, knowledge, understanding, whether it's counsel, whether it's finances, whether it's a position, an opportunity, you've already given it to me. So I just want to come on record and say thank you so much for meeting this need. Thank you for meeting the need. Thank you for opening my eyes to your provision that I would see where the provision is. But I just want to thank you in advance. I'm not coming from a place of need. I'm coming from a place of I'm your daughter. I'm a member of your royal household. You've already given me everything. I'm filled with the fullness of Christ. And I just want to thank you right now that you meet every need that I have. Glory to God. See, we pray like orphans and expect to live like kings. It's not about the need. It's about the God. It's not about our need. Jesus met every need at the cross. Sickness, disease, poverty, confusion, worrying, everything was met at that cross. Everything. He set us free from everything at that cross. So it's a come of God. Well, it's not manifesting, but I thank you. I'm not coming from a place of need. I'm not coming from an orphan spirit. I know who I am in Christ. I know what you've given me. So I just want to thank you right now for full provision. I just want to thank you for the wisdom. I just want to thank you for the answer. And you don't have to tell him the problem. <sighs> he knows. So a shock to the system, but he knows. So sometimes I sit there with people who come to me for prayer and by the time they've finished telling God their problem, I'm almost under the table thinking, it's too late. Mm. You know, but they're telling God something that he knows. They're coming from a place of need. They're coming from a place of desperation. How about coming from a place of this is who I am. I've got a covenant with you, Father. I'm your daughter, your son. I'm part of the bride of Christ, whatever you want to say, a member of your royal household. You, I am filled with the fullness of God. So I just want to thank you. So we've got people coming for prayer saying, I'm so broken. Well, you're not broken in the realm of the spirit. It's just the soul. And Jesus, as the shepherd, restores the soul. So all you've got to say is, Jesus, restore my soul. It's not complicated. It's not like rocket science. It's just God has already met every need, so thank you. I'll just receive that need met. It's literally written out to us. <laughs> <laughs> 
So you don't have to tell him the problem because that just makes it larger in your own head. Is it, God, I have this situation, but I'm coming from a place of sonship, adoption, provision, the fullness of Christ, whatever it might be. Thank you that every need is met. Thank you for directing my footsteps that I end up at the right place in the right time. Thank you. I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you. It takes all the stress out of it. it takes all the stress. And, and you know what? There are places where my soul might be a little bit broken, but I just want to state on the record that I am complete in Christ, that he did a full work, and I'm under construction like we all are, but I am complete in Christ. End of story. I'm filled with the fullness of God, that I would be liberally supplied, complete. The fullness of Christ is in us. Oh, my gosh, does it get any better than that? And then he says in verse 20, now to him, I'm going to be calling a fast. I'm just working out when. And it's not about divinity, humanity in the church. But I wanted to end on Rosh Hashanah. But I don't want to, um, I'm thinking along the lines of this prayer, that God you do exceedingly abundantly over and above anything I could ever ask, that we would have a season of that leading up to Rosh Hashanah. So I'm just working out dates and everything now, but this. But I reckon, and this is me, I reckon, how's that for Aussie? This should be prayed every day. God, I just want to thank you that you do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I could ever ask or think, according to your power that works with me. Your power is working. What, what kind of power is that? Resurrection power. It raised Christ from the dead. That's that kind of power. Resurrection power. So God, I just want to thank you that you are doing super abundantly over and above anything that I could ever ask or think, hope, dream, imagine or pray. Everything. Like, and then you'd look back and you think, man, I was thinking too small. I was thinking too small. But why don't we step up and start praying some prayers that honour him? You said that you would do super abundantly over and above anything I could ever ask or think. So I'm holding up my prayers to you right now and I thank you that you will do super abundantly over and above anything I could ever ask or think or hope or dream or pray or imagine. You're that kind of a God. Why don't we challenge him? We pray such nice little prayers that we sort of believe God can answer. But it doesn't rattle us if he doesn't. Because sometimes we have a plan B. Sometimes we think, well, if God doesn't answer, that's okay, I can do this. And our, our crafty little subtle mind has already worked out plan B. But what about you start praying prayers that you know you can't do? You can't achieve, you can't imagine, you can't do it. That might mean you might have to grow a little bit spiritually. You might have to expand a little bit. You might have to whatever. Because we always have to grow on the inside first. But wouldn't you like to see an Ephesians 3.20 lifestyle? And even those who are successful, you still want to see an Ephesians 3.20 lifestyle? You want to see over and above what you've already got? And that comes back to Genesis 1.28, be fruitful, multiply, multiply. So even if I multiplied twice or ten times, in my head I think I could still see how I could work it if I needed to. But for God to do super abundantly over and above anything I could ever ask or think, that's really out there. Why don't we challenge him? He's up for the challenge. In fact, he's looking for challenges that will keep his angels busy. Sometimes I think he can be a little bit um, fatherly. Oh, well, that's okay if that's all she wants. But, you know, he is looking to pour out the fullness of everything. 
So we, we want the fullness. We want the full measure. We want the plenitude. We want everything. See, he's so gracious and he's so generous. And according to the power that works in us, so how much of his power is working in you, there's a responsibility right there for us that we actually work the power within us. And then he says, to God be glory in the church. To God be glory in the church. To God be glory in the ecclesia. To God be glory in open heaven ministries. To God be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations, all generations, forever and ever. All generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And so that's the, that's the prayer that he prayed. That's what he wants to do. Unto him be the glory uh, for the ecclesia. You know, so the mis- this, this is, oh, regardless of what you are facing, Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 1 says, there are boundless riches in Christ that are available to you. And his prayer in Ephesians 3 says, then all the fullness of it is yours. In fact, it fills you. And we thought we didn't have a poverty mindset. Our prayers must be shaped and energised by God, by his provision, and not by human need or condition. If I come before him and pray according to my need and to my condition, I'm bringing him down to my level. But if I bring my life to him and say, according to your riches in glory, according to the wealth that I have in Christ, according to the fullness of God that fills me all in all, according to the fact that you do super abundantly over and above anything I could ever ask or think, according to that, wow, I'll take it. Expand your prayer life. Expand your imagination. Expand your vision. By the power of the Holy Spirit, because he strengthens you and your inner man by the Holy Spirit. It's his love, his power. All right, so Ephesians 1 to 3 is about the heart of God for us. Ephesians 4 to 6 is about our manifesting the heart of God on earth, which is what we pick up next week. And it starts off in first chapter 4, verse 1. Now walk. You've got all of this. Now it's time to get up and walk it out. Amen.